Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Pam Metzger. I'm the director of the Decent Criminal Justice Reform Center here at the SNU Dedman School of Law. And I'm thrilled to be presenting today a panel of experts who are going to talk about judicial, judi judicial ethics in rural criminal practice. And I particularly am thrilled um, because it's always wonderful to be in the learner's seat. Um, and this is a panel where I have lots and lots of learning and very little to offer other than lots of questions. Um, so I hope you're as excited as I am about hearing from these experts. Uh, before we begin, I do wanna tell you a little bit about this Decent Center and how this presentation fits into our larger work. The Decent Center focuses in three areas. We work on the right to counsel and the delivery of the right to counsel, particularly with a focus on indigent defense services. We think and work on topics related to STAR criminal justice, where STAR means small, tribal, and rural. And again, our focus here is primarily on how lawyers relate to the criminal legal system in smaller jurisdictions. And lastly, we think work and study on prosecution, particularly in the area of prosecutorial discretion over screening and charging. Today's panel is part of our star criminal justice system, and we're focusing particularly on rural criminal systems, not on tribal systems, because they are quite unique, particularly in the role of tribal judges. And so we wanna be careful um, to stay in the lanes. Um, and so I wanna talk just for a minute, since there are a lot of different definitions of rurality, about how we think about rurality at the Decent Center and how we're going to be using that term today. Rather than adopting a specific geographical region or a population density metric as used by the you know, USDA or the census, we think about the operation of criminal legal systems and their function. So to our way of thinking, a system operates as a rural criminal justice system. If it's got um, the following three characteristics, distance, it operates at long distances from an urban center where you might have the resources of size and scale and often of money. It has a smaller scale of operation. Caseload volumes are low. That may mean that court occurs infrequently. It may mean that judges or lawyers are traveling across county or jurisdictional lines because there is a smaller scale, a lower volume of cases. And again, that may impact economies of scale or the lack thereof. And lastly, we think about scarcity. Often here we mean professional scarcity in the context of criminal legal systems and criminal sociology. The folks who study this for a living talk about a density of acquaintance. Um, here we're talking not only about density of acquaintance that everybody knows everybody, but that there's a phenomenon known as legal deserts, meaning there's a scarcity of lawyers um, and legal professionals in those communities, often too few lawyers to meet local legal needs. And of course, that's not unique to the criminal legal system. Many of you on this uh, webinar are familiar with this crisis in the civil legal context as well. So let me introduce our panel. Um, we have with us today three experts and, and they all come from different perspectives, which is part of what makes this such an exciting opportunity. Um, Cynthia Gray is, I think, without question, um, probably the most experienced um, speaker and writer on judicial ethics that I can imagine. She's been director of the National Center for Judicial Ethics um, since 1980. Um, she writes a weekly blog, edits, edits the Judicial Conduct Reporter, um, and is generally an expert on these topics, par extraordinaire. I've already learned a lot from her, mostly about things that I've gotten wrong. Uh, next, we have Judge uh, Edward Spillane, who's the presiding municipal judge for the city of College Station in Texas. For those of you who don't know, as a municipal judge, he presides over class C misdemeanors. Those are misdemeanors that are typically non-jailable. I think that's the bread and butter of his criminal work, and he'll let me know if I'm wrong. Um, he has been an assistant district attorney prior to that in the same county, so he can talk to us about making that transition from occupying one role in a criminal legal system to another. Um, and he is a past president of the Texas Municipal Courts Association, as well as having been a member of the State Commission on Judicial Conduct. And last, but certainly not least, is Dr. Michelle Statz, who does the most fascinating research 
Um, she's an assistant professor both at the Minnesota Law School and at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Um, and she's um, a trained anthropologist. She's a legal anthropologist. And her research looks at the socioeconomic and spatial dimensions of rurality, which is a fancy way of saying that she thinks about access to justice in rural communities. Um, and in particular has been conducting a study in Northern Minnesota and Northern Wisconsin um, about judging in those rural communities. And um, she's got some wonderful resources available online. We'll be dropping those into the chat as well. So you can see some of her exciting work, which has been funded by the NIJ. So the way we're gonna do this today is we have just a couple of scenarios to get us started talking. Um, we don't have to stick only to these, but we've got a couple of scenarios um, that we're gonna be discussing. Uh, once we've gone through those, we're gonna talk about some general and emerging issues in the law. And we're looking forward to that conversation. And then we'll have an opportunity to open it up for the group so that you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. You can place questions in the Q&A. We have a team standing by that will pick them up and, and hand them off to us in the chat. You can question anonymously, you can use your name, and we will do our best to be responsive to you. So without any further ado, I'm gonna move us to our first scenario. My little attempt to be cute here where everybody knows your name. I guess I'm also dating myself since you would have to be familiar um, with a certain sitcom uh, that uh, known as Cheers and my children have no idea what I'm talking about here. So here is our first scenario and I'll give everybody a chance to read it. Um, and I guess it may, probably makes sense for me to read it out loud as well. Um, the, the scenario is this, judge goes to his daughter's softball game, may have had too much to drink, so he's yelling support for his daughter, again, maybe just like other parents are doing. Um, and like other parents, booing the ump for a bad call, especially when the daughter loses. And on the way out, you know, the ump is clearly blind or stupid. Come Monday morning, the umpire appears in the judge's court um, where she's a defendant in a reckless driving case. And it's alleged in the course of the accident, um, in the time of the accident, that she was driving without her prescription sunglasses, her prescription eyeglasses. And so the question we wanted to pose here is has the judge violated any canons or rules? Right. So that's where we're gonna start. Um, and I have to apologize because my notes on the screen have just disappeared. Can I ask um, if we could go ahead and jump into the conversation? Sure, do you want, yeah, want you me to start, start off? Blaine. Yeah, if you would sure. start, please. Yeah, this is um, uh, a very relevant question, especially in a rural community, but it's relevant for all judges uh, because we really are judges 24 hours a day. And we certainly as judges are allowed to go to uh, our children's games. We're allowed to you know, yell and cheer for the team. But in this scenario, um, it went beyond that because the judge uh, was very specific about the umpire being blind and, and not being able to see. And I'm assuming from the scenario that that wasn't just a comment uh, from the judge to uh, his or her spouse. That was something that others heard because, you know, which often happens. Uh, so has the judge violated any canons when the individual comes before that judge. And no matter what type of judge, at least in Texas, um, uh, we all are magistrates. So we also will see people of any level at setting bond, and determining probable cause when they're arrested. We could be presented with search warrants at any time of day on, you know, from felonies to misdemeanors. So all judges, but particularly in rural areas, has the potential to interact with any member of the community. So have they violated uh, uh, now that they're presiding over a case involving this particular umpire? Yes. I mean, I think, I, you know, I think there is a depth, there's not just an appearance of a conflict, but it, it is clear that this um, judge has already formed a bias and opinion on this individual. And so um, I do think that, that, recusal um, would be in order given the fact that the judge has so publicly talked about this individual. And this is, you know, the, the eyesight, the uh, faculties of this umpire 
are certainly at issue in the substance of the case. So I, I, I think the judge should recuse himself in this case, given that fact scenario. Okay, so I was going to turn it um, over to, to Cynthia a little out of order, because I think we may have a little bit of a debate here about what this scenario yields. But I know that Dr. Statz wants to um, ask a question. Um, Michelle, do you mind jumping in here? You want, I think you want to say something. You made a note about the role of rural judges. You want to jump in, Michelle? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to jump in here. I think it. this also kind of speaks to like the generational or the age side of judging as well and, and the unique role of rurality. Um, in particular, because I work with some judges who are themselves a bit older um, and older members of the community and who kind of have the, the freedom, if you will, to avoid an appearance of conflict by just conducting a lot of their personal affairs outside of a community, right? Whether it's going to dinner somewhere else, having kind of social circles in a, in a nearby community and just being able to be somewhat removed and avoid those conflicts. But a number of the judges who I work with are themselves a bit younger and might have young kids and the sorts of personal issues that might engender certainly not this behavior, but that kind of that kind of community involvement, right? So if you have a, a, a family or others who you're caring for within that particular community, there's just not very much anonymity. And so I think rural judges in particular have to be so much more sensitive um, to the ways in which their behavior is scrutinized. And that's, I think, something that differentiates along the axis of space. Thank you so much. So, um, all right, I'm handing it over to the expert. I'm gonna run through the cannons. Let me ask um, Ms. Gray, what do you think? Cynthia, what's your take on this one? I'm putting up just the two couple of cannons. You're on mute, Cynthia. I, we still can't hear you, at least I can't. No? Okay, um, so I think Cynthia is on mute at the moment. We're gonna try and get her off of mute. Um, until then, why don't I, 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 will, I will do my best to channel and say that um, my impression from Cynthia is that she's not convinced that this is an ethics violation. Um, and like I said, we are working behind the scenes to try and get her back on a mic here. Um, so while we are waiting, the chat will be available for Cynthia to put some notes in there for me so that I can try to be helpful. Um, but her thought was that maybe this isn't, even though there might be an appearance of impropriety, that it's not always going to be there, but that this goes back to what Michelle said, a judge shall act at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the judiciary and avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety. Oh, we have Cynthia back with us again. You wanna try? Can you hear me? We can. Okay, oh, so I don't think the judge's behavior at the softball game violated the code. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it was a good idea if I, this is my community and I knew about it, I might hope that someone good was running against him the next exactly. election, but I don't think that um, it violated the code. Judges are allowed to go out in public. They're allowed to drink. They're allowed to get drunk. Um, as long as they don't violate any law, they're not allowed to drive drunk. They're definitely not allowed to perform their duties drunk. <laughs> um, and they can act like other parents. I mean, I disapprove of all the parents who are acting like this at the game, not just the judge. Um, but I do agree that the next day or the next uh, you know, weekday or whatever, that it's probably a good idea for the judge to recuse, um, given the closeness in time. Um, I mean, the first consideration the judge is supposed to examine, um, in this case, it's himself, to see whether he has a personal bias or prejudice. Um, sounds like he does based on this. Mm -hmm. um, and so the judge should recuse from the case. Um, okay. And then the judge ha would have to ask whether uh, their impartiality might reasonably be questioned. And again, based on how public the pronouncements were, how uh, over the top everything was, I think it would be reasonable, certainly for the defendant and other people in the community to question the judge's impartiality. 
So let me ask about this. Can you, know, Cynthia? I'm, I'm with you, by the way, disapproving of the loud, angry parents and the and, and the games. But but I am curious, Dr. Stats, going back to um, kind of your points about the emotional toll, you know, and the role judges play. What is the pressure like? You know, when you hear someone say, "Well, if you're a judge, you have to be more careful." I know you've thought a lot about the 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 toll of rural judging. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I've thought a lot about it in my research because it's something that judges really want to talk about with me. And mm -hmm. I do want to just very briefly clarify in that uh, my previous somewhat current research has been funded by the National Science Foundation. Not oh, that right. I'm sorry. And I presently have funding from the American Bar Foundation to do ongoing work with rural tribal and state court judges. Um, so in terms of, of the kinds of, I would say, compounding impacts on judges of the lack of anonymity um, and, and critically the kind of lack of peer support that judges in more urban spaces might have, um, it's a huge deal. And it's also something that's, I think, quite hard for many rural and remote judges to talk about if not necessarily because there's stigma around mental health issues. I think that the bar and bench have done a really good job of addressing that, um, but simply because there's no no one to talk about, <laughs> talk about this with. So for instance, you wouldn't be able to just necessarily walk down the hall and talk about a case with your colleague because there might not be someone else there. Many of the rural judges I work with in Minnesota and Wisconsin are one judge courthouses. Some actually divide their time between courthouses. Um, and so also another dimension of that is just simply that social circles are kind of diminishing the longer a person is on the bench, um, if only again, because of that conflict piece. So I've had judges who say they no longer feel comfortable attending faith communities because people often come up to them with questions about their case, or maybe mm -hmm. they no longer play golf with the same people right. or go, go fishing with the same people. And I know these are like stereotypical rural activities, but they are things that come up a lot in the data. Um, and, and I think we can't underestimate the consequences of that, as well as the fact that rural spaces just are experiencing these profound professional shortages. So not only are those lawyer shortages, but they're also healthcare and mental health care provider shortages. And some people just don't feel comfortable accessing mental health care remotely, um, even mm -hmm. after the pandemic. So it's a really complicated context and one that I think we need to keep in mind. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I guess I wanna ask um, Judge, Judge Blaine for, for his reactions to that and, and also maybe change up the hypothetical a little bit, bearing in mind some of those things and, and see if we think the a change in the facts changes where we land. Judge? Sure. Um, I, 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 well, just on your first, I agree with what every, everything's, you know, that everyone has said. Um, I, uh, you know, I think actually a lot of times judges are too scared to interact in community events, and that's a shame. Um, you know, Usually where I see this uh, scenario play out is more in social media. Um, judges can, you know, have Facebook accounts. They can have, you know, friends. They can say things, but um, they have to understand that anything that they say, if it somehow will reflect in terms of uh, their work on the bench, that, that can be problematic. So I know a lot of judges, you know, for instance, can talk about all sorts of things on Facebook, but not necessarily talk about, boy, I had a crazy day in court today. Whereas, you know, a lot of other people can talk about their day. I mean, work is a big part of what many of us do and our, our whole kind of psyche is, is, is connected with work and our work friends. Um, so uh, it's real tough. And as, as, as Dr. Stats mentioned, um, it, it, it can uh, isolate judges also, um, even be more restrictive than they necessarily have to under the canons because they feel somehow that they are gonna be vulnerable, that they will be easily under attack. And uh, 
and and thus you know not have we all know not having a no which we've seen through the pandemic all of us that when you don't have a lot of the things we took for granted as normalcy that can have other effects on us uh in terms of our mental health so so let me go back to this idea of, of close-knit community and and um kind of carrying around an anxiety, I'm, I'm going to call it judicial anxiety for a moment, you know, some anxiety about what you're able to do. And let's go back to our hypothetical. I'm just going to scroll back to our facts here. And I want to suggest maybe that we change one. What if in this scenario, um, the, the judge, in fact, at the, at the time that the judge is making these comments, um, the, the umpire is already a defendant. So in other words, no, it's no longer a new case on Monday morning. The umpire is already a defendant at the time that the judge is making those comments. D does that change the way we think about a problem like this? I mean, is that any, does that have a different salience to anybody on the panel? I mean, it definitely, to me, puts the judge obviously is more on notice that there's a current case involving this particular individual and anything that I do outside the court or, or in the courtroom can, um, have a reflection and an effect, a direct effect on the case. So yeah, I think it makes it worse. Um, obviously there's conclusions that you could make too that based on the fact that this person is currently a defendant, that judge is saying whatever they're saying at the Little League game and whether that's true or not, to me, that's even a worse appearance. So uh, I, I think it's a little bit worse at that point because the judge is on notice. Uh, that this person's a defendant. However, in a rural community, there's a good chance the judge will see everyone at some point, but, well, but I think was, the judge is more on notice. That was actually going to be my next question, because it strikes me that in an urban jurisdiction, there would be no reason to assume that the judge would know who is going to be on the docket or who they are. And, and I see Dr. Stats nod, nodding. Do you want to join us here on this? Oh, I don't have too much more to say. I just emphatically agree with you. All right. Um, Ms. Gray, anything you want to add on this one? Well, there are things that the judge could have done here that would have made it worse. Obviously, many things he could have. But if he had invoked his office at all, he had, oh. you know, yelled, mm -hmm. I'm a judge. I know that this is wrong or something like that. And judges do that um, mm -hmm. in uh, completely inappropriate circumstances. Certainly any kind of slur based on gender or race mm -hmm. or ethnicity or any sort of personal feature like that. While a regular parent can get away with that, uh, a judge cannot, even in a private setting. Mm -hmm. And any sort of um, physical violence, mm -hmm. um, while well, that would break the law, um, that would also uh, take it into a code violation. Even if the judge wasn't charged and nothing came mm -hmm. of it criminally, um, mm -hmm. that can take it, uh, you know, make it a violation of the code. Um, so there are, uh, we can all come up with worse things the judge could have done. Um, but, uh, and I mean, this is bad enough, but it could be worse. And, you know, talking about judges uh, being private, this judge maybe could be a little more private. Um, mm -hmm. And now everybody in his community knows that he sometimes gets drunk. Um, so right. that's no longer a secret. Um, but as they say, uh, uh, you know, judges are allowed to do that. It's not a violation of the law to do that. It's a violation of due to do certain things while you're drunk, but in this situation, it's not. So it's interesting that there's this question of judgment, you know, what's what's good judgment, what's best practice versus what's violating the law. And there is this sense in which I guess the higher level of scrutiny that a rural judge experiences. Um, All judges I, are subject to that. Yeah, I think that's right. I guess what I mean is it's a more, more familiar or more intimate mm -hmm. level of scrutiny, let's put it that way. Um, well, just if I could add one thing that also the smaller the town, the more, you know, everyone knows that that person's a judge, you know, as Cynthia was saying, if the person said I'm a judge, and I know, you know, I know balls and strikes. Yeah, that's wrong. But, you know, in, in a small community, the judge doesn't have to say that people go up mm. to the judge and say hello, Judge Spillane, whereas in a larger community, the judge doesn't say anything they don't know, they just know he's a parent. So so you mean like at some level, you never take the robe off in a certain a community of a certain size, the robe is always on? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when when people know you're the judge, then that just adds to uh, 
<laughs> to the, the fact that you are in some way representing the court and the judicial system and your behavior. Oh, wow. So, so again, that's that sense. Yeah, Dr. Stats, jump right in. I just want to add to that because I, I've received these really kind of remarkable and at times slightly heartbreaking uh, anecdotes from judges about how that's really internalized over time. So for instance, someone I interviewed a couple of years ago said that he made it a point to only go grocery shopping at 9.45 p.m. on like a Monday night. So right before the grocery store closed, just so that he could shop in peace. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, others will very deliberately go out to eat in a, in a nearby community. Um, and I don't know that this is necessarily representative of rural judges. Of course, nothing is really fully representative. Um, but I think we would do well to also consider safety. Um, so for instance, um, I have a couple of judges who themselves engage in concealed carry um, simply because they don't feel comfortable being out in public and in particular in those smaller social spaces where ostensibly, arguably, your decisions are kind of held on to by the community for a long time. Um, I think that sort of community memory matters, maybe not to the sense of any kind of extreme violence, but people hold on to things, right? Um, and you had already mentioned, Pam, about this high density of social acquaintanceship that's kind of characteristic of rural communities. And so I do think that many judges feel the additional pressure of saying, how might this impact my reputation socially or when it comes to an election? Because those things are remembered in the community fabric. Hopefully your open carry judges are not getting on airplanes like some Congress people we can think of. Um, so let me, let me move us ahead to the other scenario. And for those of you who get dizzy when the slides move too fast, y'all can close your eyes for a second because um, I'm gonna take us back to where we were. There we go, went, went too far, here we go. So this next scenario is about the changing roles that people have in their professional lives. And Judge Spillane just spoke about this, right? Having been a district attorney in Brazos County and then moving on to be a municipal court judge in a smaller place there. So we have two versions of this scenario um, and we're gonna walk them th through for you now. Um, in the first one, Susan Jones serves as the only misdemeanor criminal judge in County A, and she's also the only public defender in County B. In uh, Court A, County A, she's presiding over court when Darwin shows as a defendant. Judge Jones doesn't remember or even recognize Darwin, but Darwin remembers her. He says, hey, Judge Jones, you represented me in County B. I was acquitted. You were awesome. And so the first question we have is, can Judge Jones hear Darwin's case? Um, and secondarily, would it matter if she'd represented Darwin's co-defendant rather than Darwin himself. And so we're gonna take these sequentially. So we'll start here. Can Judge Jones hear Darwin's case? Um, and once again, let me, uh, let me ask um, Ms. Gray to start and I can go to application 3B if you'd like. Um, that's okay, but she, she can probably. Um, okay. Judges can hear former clients' cases. Um, it's a, you know, if a judge is a new judge and, you know, they represented someone before they went on the bench, or in this case, a part-time judge can hear a former client's case. It has to be a former client, mm -hmm. can't be a current client, um, and it, the case can have no relationship to the case in which they represented their client. But then, so that's the basic rule, but then they do have to take a step back and look at other considerations. How recent was the representation? Again, how close the mm -hmm. case was? Um, did the judge acquire a bias or prejudice regarding the defendant, mm -hmm. either a particular um, affinity for them, a lot of sympathy, or as sometimes happens in attorney-client relationships, a, an antagonism towards them? Um, and they need to examine that and they need to look at, um, you know, what, how it might appear to other people. And that depends on all those, uh, particularly, I would say the closeness in time 
to the recent representation and whether did the judge represent them just that one case or has the judge represented them you know, for years over a series of cases. Um, but that's the general rule. And so Former I'm just quick. is not automatic disqualification, but there are additional factors that could throw it into that area. And I've, I've put application 3B up here because this is something that you pointed me to, which, which speaks about the specific expectations of a, of a part-time judge, um, as well as, um, you know, what kind of what the expectations might be when that judge is serving in a lawyer's role. Judge Spillane, yes. you might have had this on the other side, right? Prosecuting yes, someone I mean, I, one day and sitting as a judge the next. That must make you very popular. <laughs> I, I've been fortunate that, you know, when I was in the, in the DA's office, I did that full time and I was a judge full time. But I, you know, remember about a year ago, uh, a judge that was speaking before me when they introduced her, she was a prosecutor in 10 different cities. She was a defense attorney in another city. And she was a judge in about five other cities. So this is a real thing that, you know, I know after when this occurred in Ferguson, Missouri, when this was discussed, a lot of citizens said, oh, that can't be, but it is. Um, you have many counties where there may only be one attorney judge in the whole county. Uh, you have, you know, just situations where you're balancing between uh, the conflict, which there's a conflict, right? There's an appearance mm -hmm. of conflict if, you know, you were you you had a former client, or you do public defense work in another county, and you're a judge in 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 in, in County A. Um, but you're balancing that with people who have the ability to be a judge, who are able to to have that competence. And sometimes it's very difficult to find individuals uh, to do that, or the court meets you know five days a month or something right. like that. So um, it. It can happen. I, you know, obviously, I don't think if you're a public defender uh, or a defense attorney uh, in another county, you should never be cross examining the same police department that you hear cases over as a criminal judge in County A. So there are, you know, very, mm -hmm. you know, I think direct conflicts that you can't do. But this actually goes on. And I wish in a perfect world we didn't have this that you know, you're a full, you couldn't, you're either a full-time judge or full-time uh, defense attorney or full-time prosecutor, but because of a limit of expertise, uh, this often happens. And unfortunately it all happens a lot with misdemeanors. Thank you. Um, Dr. Stats, can you talk about, you know, that kind of whiplash of changing roles in, in the system, being a defense lawyer and 10 minutes later, you're across the county line and you're a judge or a prosecutor? Well, I actually can't speak to that in my research, if only because all of the tribal and state court judges I've worked with are solidly on the bench. Um, so I'm going to, I don't want to misrepresent that in my research context. Thank you for that. Um, let me if move I can on say, and imagine. Oh, yes, go for just, it. Just one thing on that. I will say that there have been people who I have even sent to the penitentiary as a prosecutor who have come before my court. Uh, later on uh, as a misdemeanor judge. And I have heard the case. I did recuse myself uh, one time on a particular case, but um, I have heard cases, you know, so it does come up. Um, usually a lot depends too, you know, in, in, your, in this scenario, um, I would have a real problem if the person was then asking for a bench trial from right. this individual who had, you know, been represented them before, that may be problematic, but it, it, you know, it does come up and it's just, it's just a function when people change jobs that a lot of times in the same community, they're gonna run into them later. Yeah, I mean, and if we talk about recusal for a second, so, you know, the judge decides they do have to recuse, for example, as, as you know, Ms. Gray says, they have this long affinity with the client. This is their favorite client. They represented them for, for years and years and years, but somehow they never got convicted. So that's excellent lawyering. Um, there's this tension, I think, in disqualification, right, in a rural area. And this is a comment to the disqualification rule um, that I think probably does occur more in rural areas than in urban areas, which is that even if you're gonna recuse, if this is a probable cause determination or something that's time specific, um, it creates, I think, a different tension 
um, than it might in an urban area. Um, any, anyone want to talk about that as it relates either to scarcity or, or what the judge was referring to, the infrequency of court hearings? I, I do think it's important that judges create a record because a lot of times defendants, particularly who represent themselves, and more and more defendants are representing themselves in our courts, both civil and criminal, um, it's important to create a record. They'll probably waive it or say it's fine, but create a record. And I you know, a lot of judges are in what are called non-record court, but that doesn't mean that you can't create a record case note. Uh, should the judge later uh, appear before the, uh, the Judicial Conduct Commission, those records and notes are going to be very important and key to, you know, the, the commission's adjudication when they look over the judge and how that judge handled the particular situation. Okay. And this is, of course, the, the recommendation about disclosure. If we flip these facts, does it make a difference? So Susan Jones is still the only misdemeanor criminal judge and also the only public defender. But now um, the, the past relationship was the defendant having been a defendant when the lawyer was sitting as a judge. So this is, again, the same person wearing two different hats. Does it change the, the, the answer that we have? Cynthia, does it change your answer? Oh, I'm not as familiar with lawyer ethics uh, as I am with uh, judicial ethics, even though I am a lawyer, um, but I don't represent people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, two years is, is considered a long time in, in things like this. Uh, um, often when for judicial disqualification rules, um, if they say you're disqualified for a certain amount of time, two years is often the amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, if the cases were at all related, the judge, I don't think, should uh, represent the um, defendant in the case. Um, but as I said, I'm not 100% sure on this one. Can, can I ask you a question about related, whether we're on either side of these, this question? You know, often in criminal cases, the, the quote unquote relationship is that if there's a conviction in both cases, the first case enhances the punishment in the second. Um, does that qualify as related or does yes. the related go to the subject matter? Okay, can you yes. talk about that for a minute? I mean, there are other relationships, but certainly if a judge is going to use a, um, a conviction that they were involved in as an attorney to mm -hmm. aggravate the uh, sentence or whatever, that that would generally be considered a disqualifying factor. Okay, thanks. D uh, judge, anything you want to add on this one? No, I no other than, you know, again, there's the, the appearance really does matter. And, uh, you know, if the, and I'm, I also am not as aware of, you know, the rules of professional responsibility for attorneys as I am for the canons, but, you know, definitely um, if this is allowed and the defendant is, all for this as well, that's a lot of ifs, uh, that attorney really does need to make a record uh, on, on this with this conflict uh, later on uh, if the upset defendant later on, uh, you know, goes to the state bar. So we've, we've kind of warmed everybody up. Um, and what I wanted to talk about a little bit was get into a discussion with this panel, panel about challenges and opportunities. And the first place I thought we might start is to talk about the fact that sometimes there are not such clear answers and where do judges go, especially if you are a rural judge and you can't walk down the hall and talk to somebody. Um, and, and this is one where I know um, that there's an answer. Um, Cynthia, you wanna talk about this one? Well, most states do have judicial ethics advisory committees. Um, some are more active than others uh, from what I can tell. Um, uh, and some certainly are more active online where they um, post their answers to the judge's questions online. They're anonymous. They take the judge's mm -hmm. name off so you can't tell who it is. Um, and uh, these are, I mean, the committees perform an invaluable um, function for, for judges and for the judiciary because it's somewhere a judge can go and say, I I'm facing this problem. Um, you know, I've been, been invited to do this or my, you know, daughters become a police officer. What does that mean for mm -hmm. in my community? What does that mean for me sitting on cases? It has to be future conduct. They can't say, is what I did last week okay? 
They can't ask about that. And they can't necessarily do the sort of um, uh, shoulder to cry on that people need. Um, mm -hmm. They can't do that. But they can be the um, sort of objective, distant person, who a uh, reasonable person who can give judges advice about how their conduct might look in certain circumstances. And there are um, dozens of, uh, uh, well, hundreds <laughs> over the years of, um, of advisory opinions addressing questions from judges uh, because particularly judges in rural areas who are often part-time and non-lawyer, which so if you're a part-time judge, that doubles the number of conflicts you can have almost. And uh, New York has a lot of uh, uh, part-time judges and they um, answer over a hundred inquiries a year, not all from part-time judges, but they have a, a lot. Um, they have a lot, they answer a lot of questions um, for judges. So it's a good resource for judges, um, the, the Judicial Ethics Advisory Committees. So I wanna take, I'm gonna take two, two different chunks of what you said. I wanna start with talking about why those ethics advisory groups can be particularly valuable for rural judges. And then I wanna to turn to this question of part-time judges and non-lawyer judges. Um, judge Spillane and, and then Dr. Stats, can, can you talk a little bit about the role of advice? Judge Spillane, I know that you've been really involved in municipal judge education. Parenthetically, in municipal court, where also in Texas, there are a lot of non-lawyer judges. Well, in, in terms of ethics, you know, I find it so helpful to actually hear, I don't need the judge's name. Um, I just like to hear real scenarios of what judges did and why they were sanctioned. And, you know, I know, I believe Cynthia, you even send an email and, and send out, you know, different uh, uh, cases that have happened throughout the country. I find that to be, um, very helpful. What I've discovered with ju judges in terms of challenges, uh, and in Texas, they can call 1-800, ask a question, and the commission, you know, staff who are very experienced will talk to them. But judges sort of view all this kind of like calling the IRS to ask a, a tax type of question. They're very fearful. They feel like they will be on, on some file. Um, you know, judges uh, are scared to do that a lot of times. So, um, we, we make sure in terms of educating municipal court judges that we always have an ethics component. And a lot of that will be going through real scenarios that occurred uh, mm -hmm. because there are a lot, of, a lot of different situations that judges have just not thought about. And um, it, it's really, re really helpful um, to actually read a case like this ball game. And, you know, let's say the judge somehow did get sanctioned, you know, just to read that and and follow that scenario. A lot of times that's much more powerful than just reading the canons, which are, are short and important, but they're very general. Dr. Stats, what, what have you seen and heard? I know you've listened to a, to a lot of conversation, a lot of suffering from some of what I've read, you know, judges, anxiety and concern. Yeah, so I'll start out with the less positive side of my data and then transition to something more positive. Um, yes, I, I think suffering has kind of come to the fore, or become the heart of this research in a way I didn't quite anticipate. Um, to the extent of the things I already shared, right? There's um, just a, a fairly high degree of isolation and also, and this is something I try and write about a lot, but it's very hard to write about, um, in that I do think that that sort of community embeddedness, which is often multi-generational, right? Not only could you have a judge who themselves is from that community, um, but oftentimes if they've been on the bench long enough, they're seeing generations of the same family. Mm -hmm. And there's a real sense that I've, I've certainly gleaned from the judges I collaborate with, a real sense of concern and care. Um, and, I'll, and you really see this in particular with pro se litigants. So I'll, I'll, I know that coming up, I can talk yeah. about that later. Um, so there's, there's a real sense of grief in not being able to do more. That comes mm -hmm. out a lot. Um, and then not having those sorts of wellness supports or social supports, if you will. Um, but then I wanna highlight something, which is that a lot of the judging practices that 
I've observed and documented are relatively informal, mm -hmm. um, above board, but still informal. And I think oftentimes this, the most meaningful supports that judges identify reflect that sense of informality. So mm -hmm. while there are certainly efforts um, by the state court system and, and other professional bodies to really provide outreach to rural judges, the kinds of things that judges mention as most meaningful to them are the baby judge conference, right? Mm -hmm. that, that conference that new judges or the sort of workshop events that new judges have to go through because that often builds these mentoring relationships. So there are sort of formal mentors that you get when you're a new judge and also informal mentors. And those are really, really valuable, in particular, if the, the mentor is themselves on a rural bench. Um, so I off, this surfaces all the time in my research of judges who really rely on that person and have a really trusting relationship with them. Um, I've also encountered a lot that judges lean heavily on these kinds of cohorts that develop simply by being exposed over time to rural counterparts, even at a, a relatively great distance across the mm -hmm. state, both Minnesota and Wisconsin are, are geographically fairly large states. Um, and these might be judges who self-identify both as rural and as women, right? Or mm -hmm. as rural women, indigenous state court judges. Um, and that's something that's really interesting to me. And then finally, and I'll be very brief here, um, just, it's something that came very unexpectedly to me in my research is that I offered these collaborating judges who I work with seven right now, a chance to have like a Zoom conversation about research findings. Mm -hmm. And I ended up speaking very little, which is fine with me. And it was kind of this like wonderful support session <laughs> on Zoom, just because all of these judges kind of self-selected, right? They really care mm -hmm. about their communities. They have an incredible commitment to rural place. And then by extension, felt very comfortable talking to one another and sharing the challenges, both personal and professional that they encounter. And so I think the more ways in which those forums can be created and still be, still have like a semblance of informality, the better. Wow. So, you know, it's funny, as you were speaking, an audience question came in when you were talking about the wellness supports and the supports for others. And the question is, do judges also have access to a, a TLAP, which would be in this instance, a Texas Legal Assistance Program or there are other places. These are programs that offer assistance for people dealing with substance uh, use and or mental health disorders. So the question is, do judges have access to that kind of an equivalent through which they can um, have resources or support when they're faced with an issue that could potentially bear on their fitness? Um, would anyone well, like I'm, to address that? I know Judge Spillane can address that for for Texas. I know in Minnesota, Lawyers Concern for Lawyers has been fairly public in stating that they serve judges as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I haven't found a judge who's been particularly willing to reach out. Yes, uh, in, in Texas, the state bar, it's called TLAP, the Lawyer Assistance, is open to judges. And in fact, it's open to non-attorney judges because we have quite a few in Texas non-attorney judges as well. Uh, and I served for a year. I spent a year educating all the judiciary. I went to all the, 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 the CLE to tell them about it, to talk about mindfulness, be, you know, the stresses of being a judge. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, very few judges take advantage of the program. It usually gets to the Commission on Judicial Conduct stage. And at that point, if there's a, a problem or a substance abuse problem or, or some type of problem, it's being taken care of way down the line when there's a real, you know, real bad problem. Um, when perhaps if the judge had reached out to TLAP or some resource, uh, things could have changed. Um, why judges are, you know, I talk to judges about why they don't, don't do this. And what I heard the most is number one, that just like our first example, they're in the community, they feel 
very much, they're political. Most judges uh, or many judges either run for office or they're involved in some, the appointment process is still involving politics. And so they're scared of any admission of, of some vulnerability will get out and will be used in, in some form of an attack on them. But also other judges told me that quite frankly, uh, they're afraid to admit things with their peers too, that they, mm -hmm. that they, they have this sense of a lack of vulnerability. And so it really does get, get tough for judges, who are they going to talk to? Uh, you would hope maybe there's some judges locally there that they could talk to, but a lot of times they don't have anyone to talk to. On on your first issue, you know that you, that you had talked about uh, what's helpful for judges. What what uh, Dr. Stats mentioned made me think too that you know I have found a mentoring program for new judges really helps as well, and we do have that in place. And I I've been a mentor to other judges. And, um, and I've actually learned, you know, almost as much as I've helped, uh, or maybe more, I've learned from talking to other judges and the different uh, things that come up. So assigning a mentor judge, I think, goes a long way because you don't want to reinvent the wheel, but you, judges can't always predict when a challenge is going to come their way. And mm -hmm. having another judge that they can call to, that call versus the Commission on Judicial Conduct or some official uh, organization can help. But in terms of the actual, you know, when someone needs assistance, it really is, uh, judges do not reach out. So speaking of kind of the, the varying levels of, of expertise and the need people have for mentoring, I, I want to turn to, to two different pieces of a conversation that involve non-lawyers. One is non-lawyer judges and the other is pro se litigants. And then after that, we're going to open it up for the audience. Um, this is, a, this is a map, it's current as of 2020, things may have changed since then, but it shows the states in which people without a law degree can impose jail sentences. Um, and you'll see that um, there are 21 states in, in 15 of them um, at the time this was drafted, you didn't even have to have a JED, GED, JED, GED, uh, to impose a jail sentence. Um, and of course, uh, as has been already mentioned, there are lots of lay judges in Texas and New York, and in many states, lay judges are specifically reserved for rural areas. There are some of these states where, for example, um, you can only have a lay judge if the population is under a certain amount. Um, what are the unique challenges that confront non-lawyers who are sitting on the bench? And how do we address them? And, and I emphasize again that this is in many ways, a uniquely rural problem because in lots of these states, lay judging is reserved for rural communities only as a reflection of, of lawyer scarcity. Judge, you sat on the municipal education committee for, in Texas and there are a lot of non-lawyer judges there. Correct. And you know, I'll start off saying that in a perfect world, you know, I wish every judge was a lawyer because there's just that sort of expertise that I think is central, but we're not in a perfect world. I think I count about 21 states and there's all in all those states, there's reason why there aren't non-lawyer judges. There are non-lawyer judges. I mean, one of the first, one of the uh, couple in terms of challenges is that uh, non-attorney non judges are um, a lot of times they may run for office for reasons that aren't the same that we would think, you know, that other judges who were lawyers for a while and then became a judge, uh, became a judge. They may be upset with the system. They may have been a defendant themselves and didn't like mm -hmm. what occurred. Uh, but I will say that my on the ground experience with non-attorney judges is many of them are superstar type of citizens that we that we think of as great citizens. They are giving of their time um, in that office. They, you know, studiously uh, get the education that, that is provided for their task. And this is a challenge, but it's also on the other end why we have a lot of non-attorney judges. They often do the work that a lot of the attorney judges don't wanna do. They make the decisions, the bail decisions in the jails. They go to, there are many counties, at least in Texas, where there is not a, uh, uh, you know, a, a physician that, you know, determines right then and there cause of death. So it's a, 
justice of the peace that goes out and makes that determination. So they're going mm -hmm. to a, a cause of death scene. They're, you know, so they, they are given a lot of the jobs that other, you know, judges feel they're too busy or don't want to do, but we're seeing more and more that those jobs, the setting of bond, the, the, the signing of arrest or search warrants, um, are tremendously important and, and can last. You can often, the collateral consequences can go way beyond um, the actual case. So that's a challenge, but they essentially are doing a lot of the work that, you know, that either we don't have enough attorney judges or there's just, for whatever reason, there's not been an incentive to create attorney judicial positions uh, to handle those tasks. So we had an audience question come in, and I'm hoping maybe Ms. Gray can answer it. The question is, do people appointed or elected into judicial offices receive any judge-specific training before taking the bench? Are they required to have completed any CLE-type hours? Well, it varies from state to state, of course, but in most states, there is some kind of education requirement and even an additional requirement for non-lawyer judges and specifically targeted for them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not always before they uh, go on the bench, but it's like within the first year, they have to get so much training or something like that. So they do get training, not only initially, but every year. And there are judges who don't do it and they get removed um, from the bench. It's one, mm -hmm. of the, uh, one of the things that automatically results in removal if you don't do your CLE and you're required, particularly for non-lawyer judges. So they do get training um, in that. Whether they get enough, um, personally, I don't think anyone can be too trained to do anything, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, you know, they, uh, they do get some. Okay, thank you. So I wanna move on to the second group of people who we might see a lot of, and again, we see them in urban areas, but I think there's probably, at least in Texas, I know in criminal court, probably a higher percentage in, in rural areas than in urban areas, pro se litigants. Um, in a couple of pieces of guidance we get, Right, about how a judge is supposed to handle pro se litigants. You're supposed to be fair and impartial, but you can still make reasonable accommodations for pro se litigants. Um, that doesn't seem to give a lot of information <laughs> about what you're actually supposed to do in the moment. And um, it might even be harder, I guess, if you know those pro se litigants. Here, I'll start with Dr. Stats because you've written really eloquently about the, the approach and the, and the feelings that judges have towards pro se litigants in their courtrooms. Thank you. That's a very kind thing to say. Um, yeah, pro se litigants really comprise the majority of parties in the courts where I do research. Um, and so it prompted my current project, the one that's funded by the American Bar Foundation, was thinking about the literature on active judging, which is a it comes from the judicial role reform body of scholarship and identifies judges as kind of ex moving beyond the traditional role of judicial neutrality or passivity to help elicit facts and explain process um, and essentially to kind of walk pro se litigants uh, through their proceeding. And basically most if not all of the rural judges I've worked with over the years in both tribal and state court contexts are active judges just by another name. Um, simply because with so many pro se litigants, and again, I think with that kind of community connectedness and sense of responsibility, and oftentimes just a genuine commitment to place, um, judges go above and beyond, right? Um, and there's certainly a cost to that, which is that it's really tiring and it's even more tiring via remote proceedings. And that's something that you can, it's like very observable <laughs> over the course of the day, um, owing to connectivity issues and, and, and technological literacy and challenges on that front. Um, but I, I think I'm fairly biased. I'll admit that as well. I don't think all judges do that across rural and urban spaces, that's for sure. Um, but those who I've been privileged enough to work with are, are wearing multiple hats in the course of a hearing. 
Um, and it, it certainly benefits litigants and we do surveys with litigants to evaluate whether or not they're even aware of the ways in which judges are helping them. And overwhelmingly, it, it kind of breeds this sense of accountability and care between mm -hmm. judges and litigants. Um, but again, I kind of wish it didn't have to happen, right? It would be better if individuals were represented or had meaningful justice supports. But Judge Spillane, you know, I think most of the litigants in, in your court now are unrepresented, right? Right, right. They're probably, I would say about 95% are pro se. Yes. And as a reminder, these are class C misdemeanors in Texas, right? So class C misdemeanors, but ma C. many on class A and B are representing themselves as well. Um, really? But, but uh, okay. it's, you know, I, as Dr. Statsman, you know, it's, it's, it's about, I view it, you know, an added challenge in terms of education. And, you, and there's a fine line between education and advocacy. You know, I'm not their defense attorney. I'm not the prosecutor. Um, I, but education is so important because uh, while, you know, these are classy misdemeanors, assaults, driving under the influence, um, as I said, these follow, you know, way into their future and can have a worse collateral consequence than the fine they pay or any mm -hmm. later jail time. Uh, so I spent a lot of time, one, you know, I don't want to say a good consequence of the pandemic. I, the pandemic was awful, but, you know, I did set up a YouTube court channel uh, mm -hmm. so that we could live stream what was going on. Well, I will continue to use that YouTube channel and I assign Irby a pro se defendant to watch a 15 minute video that I have on there uh, for, for non-traffic criminal offenses about ex how to expunge your case because um, more and more, everything that happens in all our courts, the data is bought, it's out there, it follows you around mm -hmm. and the legislature has provided expunction procedures. Well, many attorneys aren't even aware of all the, the changing uh, law and expunctions, but certainly people who represent, them, represent themselves don't know this and they find it very valuable. So uh, there's a challenge. I do think it's part of my mission to educate uh, individuals so that they understand their rights, but um, it, is and it, it is amazing. And at least in Texas, most people when they are arrested, even for a felony, do not at that initial probable cause determination and bail determination have an attorney. I mean, 90, I don't know how, what percent, very high percentage. So uh, the lack of representation um, is a challenge. And I think we're called to, uh, to provide education. In terms of, you know, studies, when we, when you quiz citizens, what courts they're at, they're mostly at municipal and justice of the people. They're more at mm -hmm. these misdemeanor courts. Mm -hmm. So the public's view of the criminal justice system often is these court, you know, are these courts, whereas a lot of attorneys, they're not necessarily involved in this, these courts. So it's kind of out of their mind um, in terms of the criminal justice system. But this is a big part of what everyday citizens see in terms of our criminal justice system. So let me ask Ms. Gray, can you, can you, or do you want to elaborate a little bit on this difference that the judge described as the difference between educating and advocating, right? What's a reasonable accommodation versus uh, crossing that line? Well, um, there, it's not always clear, but in most, in many cases it is. Having someone watch a YouTube video when the judge isn't even there, that's education. Um, it's not advocacy. Um, and that's a good thing. It's um, to take a step back, this rule that's in the model code, which was adapted in 2007, or the comment, um, it, the, about 24 states or so have adopted that. And then there's mm -hmm. a different version of it that the Conference of Chief Justices and the Conference of State Court Administrators recommended that says a judge may make reasonable efforts consistent with the law and court rules to facilitate the ability of self represented litigants to be fairly heard. Mm -hmm. So I there's about nine or so states that have adopted that version of it. So we're up to 30 to, that are doing this. But in most, um, but I think in a certain uh, respect, the code is lagged behind judges. Judges mm -hmm. were already doing many of these things before the code allowed them to, because otherwise their courtroom with pro se litigants would just grind to a halt. Nothing mm -hmm. would happen. 
they would just be you know, not, it, there would be disputes and there'd just be so much confusion. So judges were doing things. Um, and some of the accommodations that are talked about in these, um, in these codes, because some codes are more elaborate than this, are things like, don't use legal jargon, mm -hmm. um, you know, explain your rulings, refer to available resources, none of which could be considered an accommodation. That's really part of, you know, explaining your decisions is really part of a judge's job. It's yeah. something I hope they're doing in every case, not just cases involving pro se litigants. Um, but as much as possible, if judges can make sure this education takes place outside the courtroom, outside the context of a specific case, the better. Many states um, up through the appellate level now have really good um, pro se litigant tabs on their mm -hmm. website where self-represented mm -hmm. litigants can go and get have FAQs, they can have forms. And of course, there's been a lot of effort in years for courts for many reasons to go to plain English as much as possible. Um, so all those things can help so that as much as possible, it's not when the litigant is facing the judge that the issue first mm -hmm. comes up and first has to um, be addressed. But you know, there's a difference between a judge saying to a plaintiff, uh, do you wanna ask for, uh, oh wait, well, so I'm not sure, most of my examples come from uh, civil cases, but um, you know, do you wanna ask for um, you know, certain type of damages in this case? And a judge just saying, what are your damages in this case? You can, mm. it's a thin line, but in the one way the judge is directing them towards a particular legal theory, and the other, the judge is uh, reminding the plaintiff that they have to actually not just prove that the you know, other person did something wrong, but that they were hurt in some respect and how much mm -hmm. money it cost. Mm -hmm. And I guess I should point out that really this is, you know, in the criminal space, there are two different kind of sets of rules. You've got those places where you have the right to counsel. Mm -hmm. And if you're waiving it, you know, there's a special set of waivers as the Feretta Doctrine and, and judges have Sixth Amendment guidance. And then there are these other places where you're allowed to have a lawyer, but you don't, right? And it's not required. And there's no Feretta guidance there in terms of a constitutional mandate. And then you're very much in that space you're describing, I think, with civil litigants. Um, we had a question come in because we had told the audience, go ahead and start giving us your questions. And one of the questions that came in takes us back to an earlier co conversation we were having about recusal. And it, um, completely different topic. So I'm, I'm taking a hard left here, but that's where the audience went and I go where I'm led. And so the question is this, while it may absolutely be required, how practical or feasible are recusals in star jurisdictions, in, especially in those communities where judges have extensive or maybe historic ties? And, and I take this question to be a version of the question that I think we hear quietly or statements we sometimes hear quietly, which is, well, yes, I should recuse, but if I do, there will be no one else. If I do, this person will sit in jail for a very long time. If I do, there are no other opportunities. And I'm watching I'm watching Judge Spillane nod his head there. So you wanna jump in? Yeah, I mean, those real world balancing, you know, or, or like I mentioned, is this a bench trial or is this just a pretrial hearing? You know, there, judges make calculations all the time because you are, you know, under our canon supposed to, you know, be efficient and also fair. And if someone has to wait two years for a jury trial, that's not necessarily fair, right? You know, so, so uh, in, in small communities where we're talking about recusal, not, you know, you know, I can't hear my daughter's case, period. It's, right. Anything I do would be illegal. But in cases where we're talking about recusal, and small, especially in smaller areas, unless someone actually brings up the recusal, another party, a lot of times it will not occur. Uh, the judge will, will go forward, things will be put on the record, people agree and understand the situation, uh, but a lot of times it will not because the, the, the resources just aren't there to um, provide any sort of an efficient, uh, efficient hearing or, or procedure in the court. And I, you know, resources are a big factor when people make decisions um, on recu recusal, unfortunately. 
So I'm going to go one step farther than you did. And I'm going to say that I've had a couple people tell me, yes, I know I am supposed to recuse. Recusal being mandatory. And yet I'm not going to do it because no one has raised it. And if I recuse, there's not going to be another judge to hear this case for three months and somebody shouldn't have to wait that long in jail. All right. You know I'm coming for you, Ms. Gray. What, what's the answer there? The Judicial Conduct Commission would not accept that as a defense. Right. I think that's right. And I think one of the things this underscores in much the same way as you were talking about with pro se litigants is that you know judges in these, in these resource scarce communities depend on there being a, a, a built out infrastructure that will remove that, that crisis from them. In other words, if the problem, if the rule says you cannot sit and the alternative to you sitting is someone sitting in jail for three months, for example, without moving forward, then it seems to me that the, the crisis is actually not a rural crisis per se, but, but a failure of the state to provide resources that provide for both ethical and prompt hearings. And I think that's something that sometimes gets overlooked when we describe these as quote unquote rural challenges, right? Um, it, is that these are actually problems of resourcing that other people might alleviate. Yeah, Dr. Stats. I just wanna weigh in here too, that I often view this also as kind of part of the rural public health crisis. Yes. So in other words, if someone owing to these issues or certainly as the case in Wisconsin, can't get a public defender, um, if someone's out on bail, the likelihood of recidivism or more critically relapse is exponentially higher when there are those lag times. And I don't think we can deny the consequences of that then either. Yeah, I'm going to put in a plug here for a, what I think is a spectacular article that Dr. Statz did on um, rural legal deserts as health determinants and on the link um, between lawyer shortages and public health. Um, and there's a lot to be said about, about that topic as well, but I think it's a terrific piece and goes right back to this point we've been talking about earlier about judging being so essential to communities and community health. So we are just about out of time and um, I do wanna be respectful of everybody's afternoon. Um, I, I wanna say an enormous thank you to our panelists. Um, I have learned a lot, in fact, been schooled on at least one occasion and have really, really enjoyed it. Um, I wanna thank you all so much for joining with us. Um, please do stay um, connected with us. If you're interested in future um, Star Justice programming or past Star Justice programming, you can check out our YouTube channel. Um, I wish I could direct you exactly to it, but I assume if you put in the words YouTube and Decent, it will pop up and you can see some previous programs we've done on innovations in Star Prosecution, on delivering the right to counsel in rural communities, and on an area of major focus for us, which is dealing with rural legal deserts. And so we have a webinar on greening the desert and strategies to bring more lawyers um, to small tribal and rural communities. I wanna thank our panelists so much for their time. Thank the audience. Um, please do stay in touch and stay connected. Have a great weekend, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you again soon.